Hello, guys, and welcome back to the Wild Top podcast with me, Dan, and our co-host, Corey. Um, you all right? I am. You sound more and more depressed every single time you open up. It's just been a busy day. It's been a, a yeah, very busy it. day. Um, so, like obviously, yeah. we were chatting about it before, and I got my my good medical news yesterday. You did. started on my tablets today. I've got six different tablets um, three times a day, and they are fucking killing me off big time. And I did a... 24 mile cross country mountain bike ride today. Oh, in preparation for our walk in well, nearly yeah. five weeks. So it wasn't in anticipation of that because um, I had a meeting out of Hull and the bus that I can get, it's um, an hour on the bus and a 45 minute walk, or it's a 12 mile bike ride there, but it's through an old railway line because we get a lot of old railway lines running through Hull and mm. the seaside and stuff like that. So I'll just give that a go. It was thick mud. My ass feels like it's gone 10 rounds with Mike Tyson. Uh, you're used to that, though. Um, sorry, I was just sipping a, a a bit of Guinness again then. Your drink of the week. It's my drink of my life. It's become a personality trait of mine now. It's like um, Wednesday Adams for um, for women in it. <laughs> yeah, that's the, same, that's the second time that's come up, that's cropped up now. But yeah, you no, basically. You walking around with um, black t-shirts and dye your hair blonde. No, uh, what like a Guinness, like a pint of Guinness. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Maybe I also definitely won't. Um, I used to die when I were young in in high school, and that I used to rock the Slim Shady look. Of course, you did. Yeah, I, can I, I had that. shoulder length, long, horrible, dirty blonde hair. I can I can see that as well. I can hundred percent see that. Um, yeah, moving swiftly on. Uh, I'm, I was going to ask if you've been up to much, but other than you know being off work and dying on the sofa, I don't really think you have. I went to um I went to the Adders yesterday. Yeah, they them photos were sick. I need to do it's Adders took, this year. That's like my tenth trip. I've got a couple of little photos, but what the fuck was that? Can I just pause a second, Dad? One second. You can. There's something going on in Cobby's house. What was that? <laughs> All right. Okay. Fucking hell. I just had an heart attack. I thought somebody was trying to smash my back door for him. <laughs> yeah, that's, that'll, be why, that'll be why your house is so sore. It's real, it, the thing is, my dog's useless. I've got a 50 kilo Rottweiler and she doesn't and, and do anything. And she doesn't do a single thing. She'll just sit there. She'll probably let yeah. her in. She would. And it's so bad around where I live at the minute for young lads breaking into people's houses just whenever and just not caring that people are in or not. Oh, oh right. I, I'll edit them a couple of seconds. I mean, my heart's pounding. It turns out Teddy fell out of bed upstairs. <laughs> Oh, it's fine. Don't worry. Kids falling out of bed. It's all right. He's cool. hard as nails. I'll 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 clip that part out. Um, I'll sort. I'll, I'll I'll cut the audio out. Yeah, yeah go on. Maybe we'll leave it in for comedic effect. Yeah, go on. Actually, yeah, let's leave it. Let's That's leave quite it funny. In. Yeah. Wait, but think someone's breaking into your house. No, it's just your son falling out of bed. Yeah, that alarmed me much less than somebody breaking into my house. <laughs> he did, didn't it? Yeah, that that, that shows you parenting level. My youngest son is he's hard as nails, though. like <laughs> literally hard as nails. I, I'm so rough with him and stuff like that because my eldest is a proper wimp. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a bad way, but like he sits and plays Minecraft. He doesn't do sports. He, he gets beaten up by the two year old. Oh. He's, um, he's gonna listen. Was... He's gonna listen to listen to this back one day when you show him, you know, the early years of your life, and he's gonna hear you calling him that. Yeah, I don't mind. I call him into his face, to be fair. Maybe he'll buy you then. Yeah. Me and my kids have a very much, um, what's that, a rough, bantery kind of relationship. Like, um, we're very playful and I'm the strict parent when I need to be kind of thing. But, mm. you know, my kids know I, we wind each other up. Because, you know, I was telling you earlier on, my youngest son has been calling me a dick bag all week. <laughs> That's kind of the relationship that we have. That's quite cool. <laughs> Yeah. yeah cool. well, anyway, what was we saying before that? Uh, I asked you if you'd been up to anything. You went to the adders. That was yeah. Kind of so it. I found two adders. One of them just was not interested in me. He just kept going back into his little um, uh, hi- hibernacular. Hibernec- Is that what it's called? I don't know. You did that kind of stuff. Um, you should I know d- that. I, yeah, but the thing is, I never did much of that at uni um so i can't remember the names of them um what, what oh, are they well, called? we'll go with that but it's a little den that it hibernated in because uh, yeah. obviously they're all just coming out of hibernation ready for some funky time um and then the other one was just sat there in like um i could just see its head poking out the heather and i laid down a little bit away from it and um hibernacular that's what it's called um and he just slowly came out more and more and then he ended up 
pretty much on top of my camera. So I'd use my macro lens for it and it turned out to be a really good, really good morning. That was pretty cool. Yeah, it was fun. What about yourself? Have you been doing any photography? No. Absolutely nothing. It's been pretty slow. Um, Do you want to explain to me why you had a real bad day at work today? No. Okay. Mike has sacked. Does the colleagues listen to this? Uh, one of them does, yes. Oh, fair enough. Um, just, do you know what? Do you know what today sure. is? Uh, Tuesday. It's it's a special day for us two in particular. It's a special day for us two. Yeah, yeah. This is the season one finale. It is. It is. Yeah. Oh wow, that's been I, mad. Yeah, it has been a little bit mental, hasn't it? We've got. Let me just have a quick look. How many? How many episodes have you got to send me? We've all got to upload. Oh God! Uh, uh, Richard Burchett, Wild Isles, yeah, and um, Brooks. Brooks Haycock, yeah, yeah, um, and then Richards. And then, oh, and then <laughs> I've just dropped. I've just dropped the guest. Literally like that. Bang! Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm not quite ready yet. Oh, you're not. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not ready. I'm anyway, we we'll, we'll just forget that bit. <laughs> um, I was going to tell you my species of the week. Uh, yes, species of the week. Go on. It's Nada. I love them. Yeah, of course, they're fantastic. Um, they're obviously portrayed in the media and, and stuff as really horrible aggressive snakes and i was literally sat with one millimeters away from my hand at one point i did not get bitten it did not attack my dog adders are really cool you can't die from it well unless you're allergic the the venom is very mild might just hurt a bit but... yeah um people obviously assume that needs to be really hot for them to come out it doesn't it was about eight degrees yesterday quite foggy and misty and rainy and, and there was they were, they were out um obviously people forget that our climate is very crap Mm-hmm. Um, yep. So they're used to it. They yeah, they're used to it. Yeah, I lost my train of thought for a second there. No, it's um, all right. Very cool. This time of year, you'll you'll see the males coming out, getting ready to start. They do like a little dance, um, and they'll they fight with, like the other males. They'll all clump together for warmth and stuff as well. And the next month, they'll start getting dirty. Yes. Um, I'll bring you along when you when you yeah, go some time. Yeah, I need to I need to photograph adders. It's been a while. It's been a the while. The patch that I go to is not actually commonly known for adders because the area that they're in is about fifty square meters, oh, um, wow. right in the middle of the woodlands. The woodlands again, it's not commonly known unless you're a dog walker or a hiker. Yeah, um, they're fantastic. Yeah, you'll have fun. Um, I'll stick my hand down a few holes for you and uh, pull them out. The uh, the last time I saw an adder was down at the of the Common when photographing Colin the Cuckoo. But so again, it, it was a female because the females are like a brown, more of a brown. Yeah, they're like a chocolatey brown where the males are more like black and silver diamonds on them and but stuff. And that, that red quickly, that it quickly vanished once it saw me basking in the sun. Uh, I, so wasn't I, ba- I wasn't basking in the sun. It was basking in the sun. If I uh, if I take you to see some others, you've got to take me to see Colin. All right, that's that's a fair fair deal. Yeah. If, yeah. He, if he returns, he might never if return. Because he, he's getting on a bit now, isn't he? This will be... Uh, Double figures. It'll be his tenth birthday. Mental. Mm. I love cooking. Sorry, I was just I was just drinking more Guinness. It, it is it is quite mental considering they were, they should only live like between four and five years. Ah well, nature. Um, it does whatever it wants. I do have one cool animal fact for you there. Go for it. Do you know most frogs are unfamiliar with the British standard seven six seven one electrical wiring regulations? I I, I didn't know. And that that surprises me. I don't know, mental, isn't it? It's surprising. Yeah, I thought I thought they'd know that. No, um, some do. Fools. Um, I guess yeah. it's toads that know more about that than frogs do. Speaking of electrics, I do have a jerk. I know I haven't done these for a while and stuff like that, but um, here we go. What, what do you call uh, a really bad um... joke? This one. Yeah. What? What? Oh, sorry. What? What do you call an electrician who loses his job? Go for it, Ian. Uh, Do you get it? Oh, mate, I get it. I'm just, yeah. I yeah. thought it was funny. Mate, it was hilarious. Works for a few different like professions as well, like a magician. What do you call a magician with no magic, Ian? It works yeah. along the board. It does, I yeah, it, it does. It's, it's, it's an interchangeable joke. Um, yeah, I can't believe we've done that. Anyway. Do you have anything cool for us this week? Any, uh, any, do I have any, anything cool for us? Quizzes? Other, no quizzes other than... No quizzes, no. Absolutely no quizzes whatsoever. But um, I don't want to get too much onto it, but the second episode of Wild Isles was pretty cool. Honey Buzzards, yeah. love that. They were really cool. What, what was your favourite species? 
Um, or oh, your favourite scene? Or oh, your favourite? My, fa- my favourite scene was everything around the uh, red squirrels, just purely for the fact it was filmed at Neil McIntyre's. Um, kiss ass. I'm not a kiss ass. I just, I just love to see that the uh, a David Attenborough documentary is using a paid hide. Um, of course, they have to. Um... And using set up jumping shots. I love it. I do love it. It's great to see. It puts all these bell ends that want to bitch and moan to me in their place. So yeah, it's great. Love it. Sweet. I um for me it was the um the wild boars and the robins looking at the, the relationship they have with each other and stuff like that. I thought it was really humans are just a pig on with two legs and a spade or something is what David Attenborough said. Well, essentially because of the relationship that they have with us in the garden when we're digging and stuff Pretty like cool. that. Yeah. I uh going on to favourite scenes actually, I quite liked all the fungi. That was that was quite cool. I do like fungi, yeah. Um, I re- I particularly liked the um the the slug. Um, oh, what was it called? The um the slugs mate in all that business. Yeah, well, it was the UK's lot longest slug, like thirty centimeters long. I, uh, the wild longest slug. Sorry, I've skipped over an entire scene, which was actually my favorite, and it was uh, the full scene on Starling murmurations. Um, that would call that. You looking at the dead woodland that they used and stuff was the, de- um, the dead woodland. I also particularly liked the uh, the complete change in the way of filming. So using the thermal cameras to capture the barn owl hunting, I think that was pretty insane. Yeah, it was really cool. I really enjoyed it. That was pretty cool. Um, I'd say that was probably my favourite scene, actually. I do love a Sterling Marmor... Sterling? Sterling. A, st- a Starling Marmoration. Mar- Marmoration. Oh, I'm, I'm... <laughs> Starling Marmoration. Starling Marmoration, yeah. You know what I was trying to say. Yeah, there we go. But yeah, no, but... yeah, nothing really. Yeah. Nothing much from me on catching up. That's been ah, it. That's interesting. It's been, it's been a bit boring, but hey well, uh, I guess there's no better time than for you to introduce our guest. Now you've well, I, I, I kind of already have. Um, now we 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 uh, we spoke. When did we speak about YouTube? Oh God, I think it was with Richard Birchett two weeks. It ago. It was with Richard Birchett two weeks ago. Anyway, you're a YouTuber. I uh, you can I I, I don't like branch you, myself you, that way. You you upload every now and then. Uh, I I used to upload regularly. You did. My four, I I hit 420 subscribers yesterday, which I'm, <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a dealer in the to the the world of dev, devil's lettuce. But I just thought it was funny. It's funny, isn't it? Well, yeah. on somebody who actually posts YouTube videos, um, and somebody else who I watch on YouTube, uh, I, I'd like to welcome our guest, uh, Richard Campion. Uh, how are you, mate? Very very well, thanks. How are you guys? Yeah, not bad. Um, you, uh, you can clearly hear me stumbling over words because I'm about three Guinnesses deep now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, good, good mate. Yeah, well, I, I really enjoy Sterling Marmorations as well. Every now, and yeah, and then. Ster- Sterling Marmorations are just <laughs> yeah. top, top notch, top notch. Great, great yeah. to see. <laughs> I've, I've seen a couple. Of, where I live, I'm very lucky to every every year we get huge that Marmorations right on the um, right on the riverbank. Have you have you ever been to Hull before, Richard? Not knowingly. Yeah, you'd uh, know about it if you came into Hull. Yeah, you'd would I know would... about Oh, God, yeah, you'd know about it. You'd be okay. scared and um, in a lot of pain afterwards and your nostril hair will be burnt. And, yeah, it's not, not a nice place. But where we live on the River Humber, um, all marshlands and stuff like that, Starling seems to love it, so we get a really good population around here. Get loads in my um, garden every morning, fighting with each other. You know, um, it's one of my favourite bird songs. Mm. You know, well, you know, they're the UK's best mimicker, aren't they? Yes. Is that what it is? Yes. So they, um, you'll find, I, fi- I think this might be, I can't remember if it's with crows or starlings, but they have accents depending on what area they're from. Um, I think it's starlings. I could be wrong. It could be crows. Um, but yeah, um, and they can they can mimic um, a lot of other bird calls. So in our local park, we get a lot of uh, thrushes and I love the, the call the thrushes make the noises and the starlings in the tree will mimic the, the, the thrush call. God, yeah. Do you imagine? Do you imagine a brummy crow? <laughs> it wouldn't be my um, <laughs> most desired animal to listen to. So. Um, so, obviously, for those that don't know who you are, Richard, would you like to just um, give everybody a bit of a fact file on yourself and um, what it is you do, and um, yeah, just a bit of background about yourself and wildlife photography. Yeah, absolutely. Before that, though, I've just looked on Google Maps. So, Hull, I haven't been to it, but I've been to Bridlington, which is pretty close by, right? Yeah, Bridlington yeah, for Benton fast. Cliffs and stuff like that. Yeah, so. yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you're going back up this year at all, um, let us know and we'll uh, we'll meet you there. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I'll be back up. I'll be back up for sure. Yeah, definitely. Sounds good. I'll let you know. Um, yeah, so sorry. Um, my name's Rich, um, wildlife photographer uh, based down in Devon. Um, professional wildlife photographer, I should say. So I've been doing it professionally for about coming on three years now. Um, as you mentioned, I dabble with a bit of YouTube. Um, yeah, and I kind of just got into it, like like a lot of people, just got into wildlife photography as um, a bit of an escape, really, from, from what at the time was a very stressful job. And um, everything else that's happened since has just been a bit organic. Say. Spiraled from one thing to another. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like I, if someone had told me uh, when I was doing said jobs that this is what I'd be doing now, um, I wouldn't have believed them, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, when I, when I look back to in college and stuff like that, I thought, I mean, I had other plans for what I'd be doing with like hobbies. Like I used to play a lot of sports and stuff like that. And that was kind of my plan. And then it backfired. So I'm not I'm not too mad about it. Um, h- how old are you, Richard? I am 35. Are you, are you really? Yeah. That, shocked, that shocked me as well. That is, that, I thought you were of like my age. Oh, uh, uh, I thought you were going to say you thought I was a lot older. <laughs> no, I, man, I thought, I thought you were... I, I mean, I'm 24. I mean, there was one thing that really threw me off on one of your videos. And do you the video... Um, well, you will know it, but <laughs> the video that you did about your camper van... Yeah. So at the beginning of that, I could have sworn that you said you've had that van since 2001. And I was like, nah, that, that, that can't be right. And I was just really thrown off by it. Um, but I think I misheard what you uh, what you said. Yeah, no. yeah, it's a 2001 camp van. That might have been what uh, I got. And I, and I was like, he, uh, he hasn't, he's not in his 50s, is he? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, which way are we going with this? <laughs> <laughs> I was really surprised by that because you're you're quite young. Um, Obviously, you have just welcomed into the world, um, or recently, um, your daughter. So, congratulations on that. Yeah, congratulations, mate. Thanks, guys. Honestly, it's like um, it's the best thing, you know. Puts well, you know. I don't, Dan. I don't know if you if you have have kids or not, but I know I know you do, Corin. I definitely don't. You definitely don't. Well, (laughs) (laughs) but it's yeah, it's um. It's Just rewarding. The best thing I've ever experienced, but it's so rewarding. And she she's fifteen weeks old now, so we're getting like little giggles, smiling all the time, and uh, yeah, that's the really, best really part. Fun. The first year watching them develop and and stuff, and then they learn to talk, and all that goes out the window. Yeah, they get called, um, you get called a dick bag. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure your daughter won't do that, Richard. But I hope not. Well, as, we, as we can tell, Richard's a lot better spoken than me, and you seem like you've got a lot more manners than me. <laughs> so I'm sure your um, your daughter will grow up to be a very polite woman. Um, how are you finding being a parent, obviously, with your wildlife photography? Then, because the one thing I found from a lot of people close by was. Because I've got kids, you should not be going out and doing this sort of stuff because it's a hobby. Your kids come first, blah, blah, okay. blah, all that crap. And yeah. I thought it was a load of rubbish. Uh, how, how are you finding it? Well, look, I mean, it, it's everything's a balance. But, I mean, this this is a job. Um, so there's that side of it. But I'd be lying if I said I don't sometimes feel guilt um, doing what I do. Um, so my, I should start by saying my, my wife, Rosie is extremely supportive. I wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for her, um, and, and the rest of our family. But, um, when, when I jump in the camper van and I head off to the Isle of Mel to run photo tours and, or recently I was up in the Yorkshire Dales running some photo tours. And when I do that and, um, you know, she's at home looking after our newborn baby, I, I feel guilty, but I have to remind myself that. It is a job. I'm not going out to work Monday to Friday, eight till five. Um, I'm no longer, and I don't use this word lightly, I'm no longer depressed um, as a result of what I do. So I think as a result of that, they they get the best of me. Um, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel guilty. I, Because I enjoy my job, I don't really see it as work. So when I'm sat there photographing dippers or whatever it is, um, Knowing that my wife's at home looking after looking after Callie, yeah, I do. I do feel a little bit bad, but I never get grief for it. And I also know that um, in time, when when Callie's a bit older, not not so much this year, but she's going to be able to come on all of these tours and stuff with me, and I'm going to be able to introduce her to the natural world from a very young age. Um, and, and and I feel blessed about that. 
Uh, yeah, definitely having that balance um, is, is important. Like, I'm in a similar spot. I'm very, very lucky that my partner is incredibly supportive. I tell that I'm going somewhere, I'm doing a trip out or anything like that. Um, I don't even get a, an argument back on it because obviously I don't do it as a, as a job like yourself. It is definitely a hobby for me. But looking at that um, that that mental health balance and and the wonders it does to me, my partner says all the time she would much rather have a happy me that does disappear for a day or two here and there or maybe a week here and there and just come back relatively like really happy than somebody that's just stuck inside all the time staring at the same four walls. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with being at home with your kids. Um, I love it. I love spending time with my kids. With the the mental, we have such a, a fun brilliant time but there's only so long you can spend just in the same room doing the same stuff every day um so it is good to have the support from you from your partner from from your wife um from my soon-to-be wife where hopefully that doesn't change after i put a ring on it but we shall soon see so it's very nice to hear that um like i say i the one thing i've experienced a lot in the past especially with my friends with kids and, and stuff like that is no kids come first don't pick up your camera, sell all your gear to pay for this, pay for that, blah, blah, blah. And obviously your kids do come first, but you still have to have that have that escape, um, which is definitely what I think photography is for all of us. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you say that, about that having to have that escape. So we went on a, so I was out this morning and I'm doing a workshop. So I'm out before sunrise. So what's that, like quarter past six at the moment, 10 past six? Something like so that, yeah. Yeah, so I was out before Callie and Rosie are awake, um, got back in and then had to go out and check on the dippers in preparation for tomorrow's workshop. So today's was Dartford Warblers, tomorrow's dippers. So I wasn't able to obviously check. And I, I don't like, because I've just been up in Derbyshire running workshops for two weeks. So I don't like to go, even though year after year, I know the dippers are going to be there. I was running workshops there three weeks ago, so I know that they were nest building. I still like to go back to the site before anybody turns up for a workshop, just because just it gives me that peace of mind when I'm trying to sleep the night before any workshops. So it's very so, stressful. hundred percent. It's we were having that conversation beforehand, like about weddings and stuff like that. And I mean, every night before a wedding, my mind will be all over the place because you just think what could go wrong, what might not happen, even though you know that everything is going to be okay. Um, yeah. so I, I understand where you're coming from with that. It's definitely stressful. Um, especially when you've, people are paying you for a service and obviously wildlife isn't guaranteed in any shape or form they could be there every single day and that one day you've got a workshop there might be somewhere else feeding but yeah absolutely but i think at this at this time of year it's pretty much it's pretty much guaranteed i haven't had it i haven't had a workshop where people haven't come away with photos i think more importantly for me it's got to be that they're going to come away with an image that they're happy with i, I you could take people out um <laughs> most days of the year and find dippers along most stretches of of upland rivers and stuff. But I think that the the key thing is making sure that the location you're taking to the, them to is like conducive to them getting good images. Um, so that's why I go before it. It'd be like, I guess for you uh, to use the wedding um, example, I, I guess it would be like if you could go the night before and guarantee the same weather conditions the next day and you could recce the whole thing, it would just give you that peace of mind much more. So, so the reason that I mentioned that story was because, uh, yeah, so I, I did, did did the workshop till midday. Then it's out to check on the dippers, and then and then came back and we went for a, a walk for a couple of hours. And then I just straight into emails, um, putting together uh, a new tour that I'm going to be running. I'm, this isn't me trying to plug all my workshops by the way. There is a point. No, whack them all. Um, no, we're happy for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely yeah. mate. Yeah. No, so I was just putting together. So I'm going to be working with um, a friend of mine over from Norway to run some tours for musk oxen and moose and stuff in the autumn. So I will be so just, signing up for that. Me too. Uh, it's just gone out on my mailing list uh, at six o'clock this evening. So I'm really excited about that. But the, the point is, when we were on that, walk for two hours with with Callie trying to get her down because she sleeps really well when we're out of the house doing walks and stuff. Um, we, we talked about that escape. Uh, and it said like, she said, Rosie asked me, she said, do you, do you still get it from photography, even though it's work? Because you know, like getting up this morning, you meeting your participant, checking on the dippers. And the answer is I do. Um, but do I photograph as much as I used to for myself? Definitely not. You've got, because the thing is, you've got a lot more responsibility now that you're, I mean, yeah. well, I won't mention any names or anything like that, but there's a certain person we know up in um, in Scotland that <laughs> when they've got people in their hide, they have very strict rules where when the, the guy running the workshop wants to take photos, the other guy just has to sit there and let him do it and stuff like that. And I think that's highly unprofessional. So the fact that you're not getting them good photos for yourself, obviously it's not fantastic because it's always nice to have the good photos, but 
you you can tell that the, your main priority is your your client, your customer, um, leaving with those images instead of yourself. And when you've got a business to run, you've got to kind of sacrifice those good shots that you might have to yeah. to make sure the people that are giving you money, paying your bills, and obviously putting a roof over your head that they're the ones leaving happy. Not obviously the way you leave happy and the way they leave happy might be two different things. They leave happy because they've got really good images. You leave happy because they're um, satisfied with how the day has gone. No, I, I leave happy because they, they leave happy. That That's ultimately it. And um, I've had many, many times now where I've watched something happen um, and the, the, the first thought that comes to my mind is I wish I had my camera. But as soon as you see them get the shot and you see their face, it, it's going to sound corny, but it's true. It, it, it doesn't matter to me anymore. It, it, it makes me it makes me so happy. And I think they're then supporting me. And, th- and those people... They, they tend to stick around. They come back for further workshops. You know, they're the ones that are leaving you good reviews. And I don't think any, any image is really worth that. I, um, while I've talked for, yeah, I, look, I like, I like to take images, but it's actually just a- about getting out there. And, um, I never, I never take for granted for a second, the fact that I'm lucky enough to be able to do this as a job. Um, and I think a sure way, I'm not saying this is for everybody because it might appeal to some people, but I think a sure way of me ruining what I've set up would be for me to put my images over participants' images. It's just, it's just not my style. Yeah, no, that that's very um, obviously very the etiquette there is is, is strong. Um, I agree with you. Um, I mean, I had um, I I don't post much about this because um, how it ended, but I was running workshops last year at a commercial hide where people coming in and stuff like that. It was very much the same. The first couple of people that came in, we would come join them in the hide to make sure the day went well, and most time we'd be overseeing them, see how their photos come out and stuff like that, and it kind of made it all worth it to see that they were coming away. It makes you feel proud of the efforts that you're putting in for all the for them to get the good shots and stuff so yeah I, I definitely agree with you dan you do a couple of workshops don't you yeah i was just gonna get onto that um yeah i run the odd couple of workshops i mean i've got many in the pipeline that i'm just sort of smashing together on the website at the moment um they certainly tailed off for me which is a question i'll get around to asking you rich at some point but um yeah i i agree with you rich it's all, it's always nicer when you know the person on the workshop comes away with a photo. There's there's been opportunities that I've missed and, you know, having that photo would have been great. But, you know, seeing somebody else have that photo and enjoy that photo is 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 better for me. It feels much nicer than getting that photograph. It goes past yeah. it go it goes past just getting the image. And I mean I'll I'll take my camera on all of my workshops bar one of them. But that's just for me to just grab the odd image every now and then that I can update the website with. There's there's nothing more in it other than that. I'm never yeah. trying to out... You never want to try outdo the person on your workshop because, you know, fundamentally it's kind of their day. Yeah, so this is the thing. And I should say, I do I do take my camera. Um, I take my camera bag. Um, that's more so because I've, I have had a couple of people come that have said to me, you know, they'd feel more comfortable if I wasn't just watching them for four hours, you know? Um, yeah. And, and and some people, let's not forget, some people come. Quite a lot of people come um, because they don't actually need your guidance from a technical point of view. They just want help with locating that subject. Um, so, and, and I always have my camera in case someone asks me to shoot. It, it's rare. I've only had it a couple of times. But I think I think for me, like the way the way I see it is quite simple. There's a couple of things that run through my mind. If I'm, and I'm sure you're you're the same. And I think if I'm looking through my viewfinder. One, I'm not going to be able to give them help when they need it technically, but yeah. also like, what are you missing out on? Like today, for example, like the Dartford warblers, um, it's a great time of year for them. Everything's starting to kick off, pairing up, um, nest building or nest preparing. And um, there was so many times where my participant would have her eyes on a Dartford warbler that was quite far away in the background, like, you know, waiting for it to come closer. And then suddenly one would just pop up to the side of her. Um, and because I'm not looking for a viewfinder, I'm able to keep looking around um, and, and point that out to her. And I think that would be my concern is that if we're both, you know what it's like when you've got your your eyes stuck to the, the viewfinder, um, you, you actually, sometimes you miss, miss the bigger picture. Yeah, exactly. And it just provides that best the or the best service that you can provide for that client. Yeah. And I I also, I should say that I each to their own, like with it, honestly, like if, if there's people listening that do workshops where they use a camera um, 
and and they haven't had any any you know feedback that says they shouldn't do that then then that's awesome like i'm not i'm not saying it isn't it's just my personal thing you know yeah. just it was one of those so it should that, be it works it works for some people it doesn't work yeah, for others it's just exactly. it's just how it goes yeah exactly what other um so obviously you do your your dartford wobbler um yeah. workshop you have your dipper workshop do you just want to um just explain some of the other workshops that you run because um i mean i i'm scrolling through your website as we speak because obviously I, I see all the workshops that you pop up and there's a couple oh. on there that i didn't actually know that you did so it's um i'm learning something new okay yeah um so what do i do i start start with the seasons i guess so i do a little tour up in the cairngorms in the winter which is your your, your standard well, i say standard your your typical stuff so cresties red squirrels red deer mountain hares and then we come into spring and it's like probably my most popular workshop um maybe it's the dippers so as we come into late february this year's been a little bit slower than the last two years but like late february early march um things start kicking off with the dippers um so i offer dipper workshops in both devon and derbyshire i work with them over seven different locations um and which one we go to at the time depends on obviously the images people are after and where the dippers are at with the with the nesting season, i.e. if someone wants shots of a dipper with nesting material, then there's no point in going to a locate, taking them to a location where the dippers have already built the nest, you know? Um, and then I do brown hairs in the spring, which um, I'm very fortunate that my granddad has a farm up in the Peak District. Um, so I photograph brown hairs and offer brown hair workshops up there. Um, yeah, Dartford Warblers, uh, do those down here in Devon, um, which is really nice because they're probably the closest workshop I do to my house. They're like 15 minutes away. <laughs> and then we're, so it's April. And then in May, I do my photo tour on the Isle of Mull, um, which is amazing. I love it. I know you've been, Corey, haven't you? Dan, you still haven't been, have you? I've uh, I've never been to the Isle of Mull. It's certainly really something hope. up there that I do need to <laughs> eventually get around to take your mull virginity done. It's my favourite place. I mean, I, I, I've been so many times and it's just, it gets better and better every single time you go. I absolutely love it there. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely something I need to do. I've been toying with the idea for, for God, for the past five years, but I just never get around to doing it. I, I love it. It's, um, it. it's one of those places, I mean, people, people talk about, you know, it getting popular and stuff like that, but it, it's it's actually a, a really big island, and um, you you can find stuff almost anywhere on the island. So if you're willing to get up early and get out, or you're willing to walk away from your vehicle a little bit, you can find stuff. So away for away from any any crowds. So I, I love it. So I do that in May, and then I come home and um, beavers, which is. Just That's amazing. the one that I keep saying to you that I need to, I'm need. i going to come and do. And the problem yeah. is when I say I'm going to do something, I end up getting that distracted by other stuff. It ends up being about four years later by the time I get to do it. I've got, yeah, I've got yeah. my driving test next month and uh, oh, no, yeah. the, month after, the month after, sorry. Um, and the one thing I'm going to be doing is, I mean, I'm definitely going to come down and do some beavers with you because I've tried so many times with the beavers up in Scotland and not done fantastically well at all. So it'd be good to come down and um, and see how, how, how uh, your workshops are. Yeah, I mean that would be awesome, and um, that sounds like timing-wise, it'll it'll work work out really well. But you know, hopefully, uh, given that they were granted a protected status last October, I think, um, hopefully they'll be here for many years to come. So um, you know, if it's if it's not this year, then they should still be around next year. But they're they're spreading further afield down here, which is awesome. I'm lucky enough to live in a village where the river Otter runs through. Um, so we actually get beavers that come through the river in my village. Um, I don't work with those guys because they're, they're a lot spookier, but the family that I work with, um, the family of beavers last year, we were, there's five of them. Um, so it was really, really good fun. And yeah, I had three months of, of, of workshops down there and, uh, we saw the beavers every single time. That's, that's not me. Um, trying to gloat about my workshops. I'm not saying people always got the best images as a result of where the beavers were. It's just, it, it just bodes really well for the future of the beavers, you know? Yeah, I mean, we, you're getting them up on the River Trent, up near us and stuff like that. Oh, now. wow. They bred there last year over Scotland. Obviously, they've got the, um, they've just um, set up work on Loch Lomond with them. Um, they are, 
they are spreading and hopefully in a couple of years time they could become a, a prolific, prolific mammal on our river banks and stuff because they are a fantastic species because they, they were introduced um near you for uh it was a landowner wasn't it and he worked with the university of exeter i want to say to combat um flooding with a natural defense um so, i might I, I might be it might be not your location but i'm pretty sure that was the same um no, the no, same yeah, site. So, yeah, so, so I just finished, well, I say just last year, I finished reading that book, Bringing Back the Beavers by uh, Derek Gow. I hope I pronounced his surname correctly. Um, and yeah, they talk about it, but actually um, the beavers, the population that I'm working with, they don't know how they got into the river otter. So <laughs> I think it was a young couple that had some land that, that, that found some, they had a little brook or something running through the bottom of it and they saw some, some dams going on and, I think they put in a phone call to somebody and said, oh, we've seen a beaver in the garden. And obviously, naturally, no one believed them. Um, and then I think they found one um, nearby that had been hit by a car. Uh, and I think, I think it went from that, really. They're like, oh, we've got to take this seriously. They're obviously our beavers. And then I think quite quickly, people started to, some people started to say, we don't really want these back in our, in our, in our rivers. Um, and then Problem is, yeah, though, right. they were in their rivers long before we were using them rivers. So it's, yeah, yeah, um, com- completely. I think, I, think, I think, yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think, I think then what happened was um, the Devon Wildlife Trust and you're right, Extra University put together a five year program, and they said, look, what are your concerns? Let, let's let's monitor them for five years. Let's let's see how we can coexist, and you know what the pros and cons are, and then let's let's readdress it. And uh, we're very very fortunate that. Exeter University and um, the Devon Wildlife Trust did that. And as a result, we, the beavers are now staying um, down here in the River Otter and they, they're now protected, which is just amazing. Because it, up in Scotland, up until obviously October last year when the law passed, they were still getting cold every year, um, yeah. which is which is awful. And the thing is, the numbers, I think it was up to 72 beavers could be culled per year. And for a species that has only just come back to the UK in the, in the grand scale, in, ta- in like the scheme of time and stuff like that. Obviously, was it 2009, I think, they were reintroduced? Um, yeah. for a, that's not long for a species, really, to to build up. Um, so for 86 or whatever it was, or 70, I can't remember what number I've just said, um, it's an obscene amount of beavers, um, and that will just surely put them back into the same spot they were in before, but the fact that the law has been passed is, um, is really good news. It, it says a lot about us. As, as humans, um, that we can be responsible for reintroducing and um, making something exist in such a short amount of time, you know, and 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 the fact that that was going on is just it's just sad, really. It's just it's just sad, and uh, I, I I don't know. For me, I, I can't comprehend it. So I don't think like that. But I'm sure if you have someone on the podcast that was um, maybe involved in any of those calls, they, they may well have good reason. I, I, I don't know. I'll never understand it. But I, I'm not think, educated enough to kind of to kind of say why they do and don't do it. I don't think they're really, in the in the in the, the bigger picture. I don't think there ever is a good reason though, because like they they were here long before us. They are a natural part of the ecosystem. And yeah, fair enough, a farmer might kill them because it's flooding his land, but is his land being flooded more important than a species that's always been here? It, it, survival, like that's that's how I look at it. And it's like I say, I, I don't necessarily have the education to back it up and I've not spoken to many people about it, but I think if something was like, like I think let's look at minks, for example, completely different species. They're a mustard that doesn't belong in the UK. And they are cold whenever they're seen because they're destructive. They destroy our ecosystems, which is fair enough. Beavers, on the other hand, are actually part of our ecosystem. So they belong here. And I think there's no really good reason to call them. Yeah, I agree with you. I just, um, I'm a bit of a fence sitter. <laughs> I used to be. And then yeah. I don't know what happened. I think it's because I met, I met Dan. And Dan, you're not already a fence sitter, are you? If you don't like something, you tend to rip into somebody on Facebook for it. <laughs> I wouldn't say well. I rip into the people that deserve it. I've I've realised I've been really really quiet here, but it's purely because I've been flicking through your website, Rich, looking at the Norway in autumn tour. 
Yeah, um, you just send the deposit through to um all, <laughs> honest, honest to god mate i'm i'm half tempted i am half yeah. tempted must i couldn't some... find it i'm having a look now and uh if you go oh, on the, if you go on the home page and then yeah go to norway in autumn as the second option in, oh, there we go yeah um i'm oh, sorry i've just been like completely zoned out reading that uh yeah it looks looks pretty amazing um i it's been a running joke for the past, well, since we started season one, Rich, as uh, I'm I'm obviously going on a trip to a country to photograph something. And um, it was a running joke for a while that I was going to announce it on the day that I was going, but I finally caved uh, on the episode we filmed, or well, filmed, recorded with Brooke Haycock. Um, so okay. I'm, off, I'm off to Finland for the uh, Brown Bears. Oh, yeah. Uh, when I, and not next month, month after. So I'm going in May. Oh. So like eight weeks tomorrow, I think. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely, uh, definitely intrigued about the muskox as well. I'm yeah, that, now and, and that uh, Finland trip down will be. Sorry, Corey, to, cut, to have cut you off there. No, just just to say that that Finland trip will be incredible. I think your trip of a lifetime. Oh, absolutely! It's definitely. It's, I've been toying with the idea for like four years. So I've just yeah. kind of bit the bullet and kind of gone for it. So yeah, it should be. Yeah, it should be quite good. It should be really yeah. good. Um, I think seeing something like that in the wild, just, it, it, oh, I just can't even, we we, we had a, um, before COVID, we had a two-year visa to move out to Canada. Wow. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I won't, I won't bore you with what ended up happening. You probably worked it out, kids, married, stuff like that. But um, see, the, the, the thought of seeing bears was just something that I was just so excited about. I still am. I'm still, I'm definitely going to go. I'm definitely going to go to Finland myself. Um, so yeah, very jealous of that. Uh, so yeah. I'm doing the oh. same tour next um You next are, June, yeah. I think. But I'm also now looking at your musk oxen trip and <laughs> I want to have a photograph, musk oxen or bears. And... I know, I'm tempted to do this both in the same year, to be honest, but... <laughs> oh, I don't have that kind of money. No, me I'll neither. Pull. I'll find yeah. it. <laughs> My doll runs um, out tomorrow. <laughs> oh yeah, universal credit will come in in a few weeks. So why, mate? You're all right. So um, with the with the muskox, and so I run it with um, a friend of mine, Evan, who who's who lives over in in the national park. And um, just to give you a little bit more information, because it's, it's one of those when you when you're put advertising these tours on your website, and stuff, you've got quite a short. There's a fine line between too much text, too much yep. information, and it putting people off. But you, I just, I could have gone on and on and on because, like Evan's house, we stayed there for like a week last um, winter, uh, me and my wife, and um, it, he's got four pop-up hides in his garden, and okay. his garden backs onto a big Norwegian ancient forest, and he said to me, "Oh yeah, yeah, we, you know, ju- if you want, just jump in the hides whenever you want. Like we get red squirrels, we get um, or, uh, roe deer, and all this." I was thinking, "Oh yeah," and I was thinking, like, you know, how if we put a hide in our garden here, you might see something, you might not. Honestly, first, as soon as it got light, all these road deer just started coming out of the forest into his garden. Red wow. squirrels everywhere. There was jays landing in front of the hide. Um, it was just incredible. And then you've got um, pygmy owls, hawk owls. So it's kind of one of those tours where we're, we're aiming it at the musk oxen, the moose, the Siberian jays, and the landscape photography. Well, you but you could get reality, anything. Yeah. Oh, honestly, you, you could get arctic foxes, um, hawk owls, pygmy owls, you know, it, uh, and Was Evan's it? such, he's like me, he's so, he doesn't want to oversell and then under deliver. He'd rather undersell it and, and over over deliver, if that makes sense. Yep. Is this the same place that you did your videos on the Pygmy Owls? Um, yeah. Because you did some videos. Was it was it the Pygmy Owls that you did the video on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Same, same, uh, same, same place. Same it looks my, it look brilliant. And that is a trip that I mean, I, I mean, I've always wanted to go to like Scandinavia and stuff like that, them kind of countries. And Finland is going to be a good one, but I meant Norway and and looking for muskox and might actually beat that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Price, same price. So. <laughs> it is. It is. We've sparked. We've sparked thoughts in your mind now, haven't we, mate? Well, I've got permission from the missus to do it, so mm-hmm. I shouldn't right. learn to. I shouldn't learn uh, well, to for it. Well, 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 do it. I mean, I, I looked at um, flights just to get get a rough idea. If, if <clears throat> excuse me, the reason I don't do include people's flights is because logistically it's a nightmare. It's much yep. easier to say we'll, we'll meet you out there. It also means I can go a couple of days early, get everything set up, and just um, pick pick the participants up from the train station. But I looked at flights, you know, and to fly from like Heathrow, for example, with BA to Oslo was like fifty odd quid. Oh, wow. hell. See, Finland was four hundred quid. Yeah, well, I couldn't even get the train up to um 
to Hull for 50 quid, I don't think. But to be no, able to fly to Norway in two hours, you know, it's, 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 it, it'd take me longer to get to, to Hull on the train. It would cost me more money. See, my problem is I have a huge phobia of flying. So to do these yeah, sort of trips, is, I just, I, I can't fly. I, I mean, I've been abroad plenty of times and, and stuff, but flying is just one thing that no matter how many times I do it, I don't think I'll ever get over it. Yeah, no, I'm exactly the same. It's com- completely the same. Um, but I, I, I see it like you've kind of, I'm not, I'm not making light of having a phobia. I just see it. It's like, you've kind of got two choices. And if, if I want to see these things, I want to photograph them. I just have to go and I just have to know what my triggers are and how I can make it more bearable. I.e., making sure I'm not running late to the airport, making sure I've got the seat at the aisle on the aisle so that I can feel like I can escape when I want to go to the toilet, stuff like that. So I think I, I, I'm petrified of it, but I just I'm, I'll be damned if I let it stop me doing things I want to do. I am de- I am determined. It doesn't stop me, but yeah. the fear is there. And I know if I go to my doctors, I might get something to calm me down for the two hours yeah. while I, yeah. I fly over. Because I'd get into the airport's fine. Wait, waiting in the airport is the most anxious part because I know I've got to wait and I'm just like, it's yeah. dawning on me. The time's coming that I've got to fly. And then it's the takeoff and landing. I, I can't stand it. It's just, yeah. it's just awful. And that's why I'll probably never visit places like Australia and stuff like that is because I don't think for that long I'd be able to cope with the flying. I think within Europe, I mean, I've flown to Tunisia, which was four hours i think in turkey which was four hours and i can manage that at best but any further afield might be a little bit too much for me yeah no i i get that dan do you have you ever flown dan dan he's that engrossed in the website he's currently putting in his bank details <laughs> can, can you hear us dan I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. I went. I went for a very, very brief toilet break, but I heard something about Dan's bank details. Um, we were just, we were just putting out your um, your long number and your three digits and expiry date on for everybody to hear. Oh no! no I, I, I yeah, asked if you'd ever flown abroad before. Me? Uh, yeah. Yes, I've only I've only ever visited Spain and Portugal. I've never been to Portugal. I've been to Spain twice. Um, once. Tunisia, I've, Turkey, Greece. I've been to Belgium on a extremely morbid school trip for history, where we spent three days looking at war graves, um, which yeah wasn't wasn't the most hap- well, well definitely wasn't the happiest holiday I've been on. Um, but yeah, yeah that's, that's about it for me. So yeah, Finland will be my first time flying solo. I flew so I flew solo to Turkey when I was seventeen. You know, I was younger than that because it was before I had Riley. Uh, Sixteen, I think I was. Flew solo to Turkey. Spent a week there, and that was all right. But um, I think I mean, we we got away from the kind of the general chat of the um, the podcast because we were we were looking at YouTube. Obviously, we got an insight from Richard Birchett last week of well, his YouTube channel. And just just before we go on to the whole world of YouTube, I I had a question more around well tailored around workshops again rich um so obviously i i i don't run anywhere near as many as you do um but i i ran a few um before lockdown and then obviously you know covid hit and i, uh, I think me and many other uh, workshop uh what's the, word, what's the word i'm trying to look for workshop offerers let's use that word terrible english but yeah um obviously had to cancel a lot of their tours. Um, how did you find sort of the whole recovery process after lockdown? Because I know I, I struggled and I damn, I am still struggling to sort of get people on the tours. Did that affect you much? Or I, I suspect it might've been hard to obviously um, advertise that again and get people coming back on. But yeah, what, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah. Firstly, sorry to hear that, you know, that was your, your your situation and that you struggled, you struggled with it. I think loads of people did. I think for me, it was a bit different because um, I kind of started, it's going to sound a bit weird, but I started at that time. And I, I mentioned before um, in the intro that, you know, it was an organic thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't have to deal with, I didn't have any overheads. Let's, let's say I didn't, I didn't organize any tours that got canceled or anything like that. I, I basically, um, left my job in finance, left where I lived in Jersey. We moved to Devon. Um, I had two years worth of savings to, to go to Canada um, and, it, and it wasn't going to happen. But I felt, we, you know, we were, we were locked down. We were restricted to an hour outside or whatever it was. Um, and then I just started going out and just doing 
Instagram stories and, 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 and stuff like that. And then it kind of all just happened organically, you know, DMs from people saying, oh, do you, do you offer workshops? When lockdown's over, will you offer workshops? So I kind of used lockdown to build a bit of a, a platform. Hmm. So, so it's kind of the opposite for me. I didn't, I haven't, I haven't been through that, but I, I, but it wasn't like it was easy. The first, the first couple of years or the first year, year or so it was, um, every booking I got was, was gold dust and it was, um, not to be taken for granted. And then it's just keep pushing it, pushing it, taking more risks as in like, um, putting on more tours where you've obviously got the outlay of the, of the costs. Uh, whether people come or not, you've you've paid for your travel, you've paid for the accommodation and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but no, I, I haven't I haven't experienced anything quite like that. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry that you'll take it. But I think I think things are picking up. I think the unfortunate thing at the moment, and I guess I have experienced this. Um, when I was talking to another guy who um, runs workshops about it. Um, it's what we offer is a bit of a luxury to people. It, it it's it's not going to. If, you, if you've got a list of things that you're going to spend your wages on, I, I don't think wildlife photography days necessarily come into it. I think they kind of come as like a, a bonus if you've got a bit of money left over. Yeah. So as we're in this um, horrible situation that the country's in where everyone's feeling the pinch, um, you know, it, it peaks and troughs. And, and, and I never read too much into it. I never think, oh, it's been... I haven't had any inquiries for a couple of days. You know, what is it I'm doing? Do I need to change my offering and stuff like that? It's just that times are hard for a lot of people at the moment. And yeah. um, I think that is still coming off the back of COVID. So it'd be, I think when everyone was locked down, sorry if I'm waffling on a bit here, but no, go for when, it. It, when everyone was locked down, I think people had this whole new take on how they were going to live their lives it was like um carpe diem you know just seize the moment just as soon as as soon as we're allowed back out i'm just going to do everything that i wanted to do and a lot of that included people booking trips and doing workshops and buying the camera they've always wanted to buy and taking the online course that they've always wanted to do um so i think there was that initial spike for me where people came out of lockdown and they were like hey i've seen what you're doing on instagram for however many months um could i come do dippers or whatever and then it was it started to like go quiet and then things started to like pick up as i got a bit more established in what i'm doing but um yeah i haven't experienced what what, what you have where i've set it up and and covid kind of knocked me on my backside yeah oh interesting I was saying, Sorry, that was a very long answer. No, no, mate, no. We, we, if you've learned anything on this podcast, we go off on tangents and long answers, and we may never even answer the question. But no, yeah, it's, it's great to see that it's not it's not affected you as sort of some people do, or some people has. I know I've got a couple of friends or friends acquaintances, whatever you want to call it, who you know did it full time prior to COVID. I think <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely hit them. Um, I can't yeah. profess to say that it was a full time job for me. It was just something that sort of paid for the trips, and I got I got a sense of enjoyment out of helping others. Um, but yeah, it, it was definitely a tough time. But hopefully, it'll pick up soon, like you say. But then again, we are in a cost of living crisis, so it's, it's probably not on the forefront of some people's mind. But the people yeah. that want, the people that want to do it will will pay to do it. I guess at the end I of the day. Absolutely. And I think you guys probably know that too. You know, it, 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 if you really want to do something, you seem to find the money from somewhere. Um, Absolutely. So I, 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 sorry, I missed that. Yeah. I sell, sell an organ. Yeah. <laughs> if, if so, sell an organ. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm not going to encourage that. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I shouldn't encourage that either. Um, you, know, you, do, you, you I suppose you pluck it up out of, um, out of somewhere, but no, it's, I mean, I noticed after lockdown, um, I think lockdown kind of, you know, was a bit of a blessing for me because it did boost a lot of, um, my photography massively. So yeah, it had its, um, it was an awful time for the country, but it still had its kind of upsides and I ended up buying lenses cause I wasn't aware cause I wasn't doing anything. I had the money to spend on other stuff. Like I was saving wise and stuff like that. I didn't have to, we didn't have like the days out. I only had one child as well, so we didn't have a baby or anything. So it was just a little bit easy for us. But um I mean I've certainly noticed since sort of coming out of lockdown, I've definitely visited less commercial hides. 
you've probably seen that as well, Corey. I've got, not that oh, I rely. That's not what you do. Not that I. <laughs> not that I relied on commercial hides, but it's it's nice to visit them every now and then. And I used to do it frequently, but certainly these days it's. There's nothing yeah. wrong with it at all. It's nothing wrong with it. They're just yeah, it all adds up, doesn't it? I guess at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and that's it. And it comes back around to what we were saying, doesn't it? If 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 you wake up in the morning and you're feeling a bit flush, then you might go jump in a hide. Um, if not, you might just go out into your local field and see what you can find, you know? Exactly. There's wildlife everywhere. That's a good thing about wildlife is it is literally everywhere. You just need to put the time and effort into kind of looking for it. And um, so the more time you put in, the more reward you get back from it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, did, I will move on um, to your YouTube because obviously that's where most people do know you from is you run a very successful, I would say, um, YouTube channel. So how did that um, come about? What made you plunge into that world? Sure. Well, firstly, like thanks for, for saying that's very kind. I I, I still see it, and it, I feel like it, and it is in the greatest a very very small channel. Um, it's how it came about. I probably well, I'm actually going to put it all on my wife. Really, it's kind of her idea. Um, I buzz off being out in the field and witnessing something for myself, and knowing that I was the only person to see it. But I would find, I don't know about you guys, I'm sure it's the same. You'd, you'd get home, you'd speak to your gran, your mum, your wife, whatever, one of your mates, uh, whatever, and you'd try and explain the feeling that you got from seeing that hair box for the first time or whatever. And then they'd all just glaze over, you know, uh, like, and, and they wouldn't kind of get it. Um, I was just chatting to Ro about it, really, and she just said, you're so enthusiastic about these dippers. Why don't you make make a video on them and just and show people kind of what they mean to you and the rest is history really i did it it was the first video was well received and um yeah just just carried on doing it yeah it's a great channel i love watching it um Thank i think you. you can see the passion there i think you piece together everything really nicely yeah very very well spoken so um it's easy to understand so in our talk i've got my crappy old accent um which is not the nicest, but um, no, you can see the um, the level of confidence, and especially, I mean, I, I do watch, I think I've watched every single one of your videos to be fair. And watching how you started compared to where you are now, you can definitely see that your um, the confidence has come along. I didn't notice in like your first video, I mean, it was brilliant. Um, but the way you talk compared to now, you're very much there was a lot of stopping and starting, which I, I did a lot as well. I ummed and ad and, and stuff as well, but now everything flows really nicely. And when I get the notification that you put a new video up, I'm always very much looking forward to, to seeing what you've, um, what you've got for us. Well, well thank you. And, and I think um, you don't be so hard on yourself, you know, about the way, way you speak and stuff. I think um, it, it, things like that just don't matter. Right? I mean, when, when, when you're from the South and you hear someone speaking with a, with a Northern accent, we, we, Think the same. Yeah, I like I like the Northern accent. You know, my family are all from Derbyshire, and I was always really jealous of the way that they speak compared to the way I speak. You know, I was raised in in, in Oxfordshire, or oh, Buckinghamshire, sorry. So, you know, all my cousins speak with this like broad Derbyshire accent, which I absolutely love. And then, I, so I, I guess it's one of those things. It's like you grow up with straight hair at school. You want to have curly hair. You know, you get have curly hair. You want to, it's kind of one of those things, you know. So I think the way you speak is cool, so you should just own it, really. And I, Yeah, I think... it's, it's, it's one of those, though. I don't know. I think the whole accent for Northerners is more quite a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I get where you're coming from. Like, I I, I love the Southern accents, love the Scottish, a Scottish accent. Yeah. So they'll probably be thinking the same about us and, and so on. Yeah, that's it. And I, th I think that is it. But yeah, go, uh, uh, with regards to the first video and now and stuff like that, yeah, uh, it's it's so noticeable, isn't it? I don't watch my old videos back, but I recently did a um, dipper video where I can't remember what, what I said, but basically where I referenced. I think it was two years to the day <laughs> that I filmed that video. So I was like, I'm going to go back. So I had to overlay some footage in from the, from the first video. And I was like cringing watching it and, and and i think the truth is um i've stopped worrying as much so if you were to watch it um back i apologize the whole time so i'm like oh, i'm hor i'm sorry if you can't hear me that well the river's quite loud where i'm lying at the moment i'm sorry if you can't see me that well there's a bit of side light coming in through the trees 
oh, I'm sorry if the footage is a bit shaky. I'm having to like lie in the river in the middle of February and I can't do everything. You know, and I was like, and, and I was very concerned about not only producing the best that I could, I was concerned about how it would be received and like I, essentially trolling. I was a bit worried about that because I know that when you open yourself up on platforms like YouTube, you, you open yourself up to, to trolling. And um, I guess that was one of my concerns at the start. And then after you've had a few comments like that, you, you get a bit of a thick skin. And now I, I used to go out, I'm not joking, I used to storyboard my videos, the first couple. I used to sit in sit in my office, storyboard them, be like, right, start this. Walk this many walking clips, piece the camera, this many walking clips. And then I'll do my piece the camera. And if I stuttered or I coughed because I've got a cold or something, I'd redo it. I'd, I'd redo the whole clip and then I'd get back to editing it and I'd be like, oh, which one was the best one again? There's six different opening pieces to camera and I'd have to watch them all and I'd have to remember which one I preferred and why. Now I do it all in one take. And if I cough, I cough. If, if I stutter, I stutter, you know? And I think that comes with growing a bit of an audience and people kind of knowing who you are, I think maybe like people kind of get to know who you are and how sincere you are. Whereas when it's your first couple of videos, you're really trying to show them that you're sincere and you probably go a bit too far the other way. Mm. Yeah, I um, yeah. I got to the point now where I don't even do on-camera stuff. I just do voiceovers afterwards. I noticed that. But it's good. It works. I, I've just become so lazy with it. And the one thing I'm, I'm, I know I keep saying I always take breaks, but I'm taking like a proper break from it just to kind of give my mind a bit extra knowledge and not knowledge, but just so I can come in with a fresh mind and redo my videos completely. Because it is, you'll know, it's tough to keep on top of and you start thinking, well, what video can I, can, can I do differently this time? What can yeah. I do this time? And, and stuff like that. So it just gets, it's very stressful for me. I enjoy doing it, um, but I think it's a stressful plunge to take. Well, I, I really enjoyed, um, you know, like your Pine Martin one stuff with the, I'm not saying I didn't enjoy ones before. I just, I really like the whole, I think when you, you, you put the, the footage in, you put the ambient sounds in, then you do a voiceover. It comes across a lot more cinematic. Um, and and I, I really enjoyed that. So I think... Well, I, pre my, I appreciate that. Yeah. So I, I think just keep doing what you're doing. And if it works for you, it works for you. But I also second what you're saying. And, and I call them like little... Probably sounds a bit pretentious, but like a little creative break. Um, at right right now, I've got four videos in um, Final Cut that I'm working on. They're, they're all filmed. It's just editing them and getting around to putting them out. And uh, you sit there and stare at your computer, don't you? Like you can hear it beckoning you to come edit it, and you just put it off. I've got two from Scotland that I still need to finish editing, and I just put it off so much. Yeah, I think I think the thing is as well is like I I strive to try and get them as good as they could be. So so take take one of the ones um, I, I've just filmed coming out. It's on um, chuff photographing chuffs over in Jersey, and. Um, I I had a really good time out. It was on my birthday, went out, and they're, they're not an easy bird to see. Um, they were almost extinct here in the UK, so I was like, it'd be really nice to go out and photograph them. Anyway, found some, and I got some footage of them, and, and I've got a, I don't know, 14-minute video out of it. But the footage of the birds could be so much better because I only had like a 20-minute window before I had to leave. So, so I had to work with what I've got. Um, I couldn't spend all day there. The birds didn't. It took me so long to find them. And then I sit there watching video going, this isn't the best footage I could get off these birds, but I'm not going to jump on a plane and go back to Jersey just to, just to get better footage of them, you know? And then I lose a bit of motivation in that video. I kind of look at it and go, ah, I don't know. It could be better, but I can't do anything about it. And then what happens is I wake up one day and I'm like, right, just put it out there. And I've done that with so many videos. I'll have like a three month break. And then I'll just, I'll put it out there. And then when they're well received, you're like, oh, I shouldn't really have, you know, held, held off on that. You're so much more, um, of course, you, so, you have so much more criticism on your own work than what other people do. You are, yeah. you do, you, it's natural just pick out the faults on it. I was like, when I photographed Puffins on longer, I, um, I looked back and I thought this, this footage could have been so much better, but I'm not going to go back up to Scotland or go back up to longer just to, to redo it because it's, Pointless, like you said, you might as well just piece together what you've got and try and make something from it. I'm yeah, the same, I'm the same though, that. within photography. I mean, I don't really do much videography these days. I film the odd reel every now and then, but I tend to forget to click record. Um, but I think, I think myself and 
quite a few other photographers that I speak to are so self-critical about their work. You know, you can sit there, can't you, looking at an image that you've taken and you can edit it and you can look at it and you can edit it again. And, you know, you can spend days thinking it's not good enough. And then you post it on Instagram and it, it's received really well. So, yeah, I, I guess it will fall into the same as creating videos. You know, you always want to strive to produce the best quality content for the people viewing it at the end of the day, whether that's a photograph or a video. Oh, absolutely. And I think um, that's basically it. And I think one of the things that I don't know what, what you what you guys do when you're posted, but when, when I'm out in the field filming them, I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. I enjoy the process. I enjoy being with the wildlife. I buzz off it. I go home, get excited. And then what will typically happen, right? And this happens with stills as well. Is you'll jump online and then you'll be like, hey, my, my favorite YouTuber or this YouTuber's just filmed a video that is so much better than the one I just filmed. <laughs> yep. And and I think that's it. And we, we kind of, we all get imposter syndrome. Like you said, we're all our own worst critic, but it's the same thing with stills. You'll, you'll go out and you'll be like, oh, I've waited eight years to photograph brown hairs in the in the snow or something, right? And you um you capture an image and you are buzzing, absolutely buzzing. That feeling lasts for a couple of days. And then you're sat there on a Sunday and you're scrolling for Instagram. And you're like, you see like Andy Parkinson's image of a brown hair in the snow or yeah. Tom, Ma- Tom Mason's or something. And you're like, oh, should I just delete mine now? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and the truth is, no, I think like, you're doing it for the reasons that I mentioned that you're buzzing off it for a few days and you've waited all that time to get it. And and quite often it's just serendipity that you're, you're there when the hair's there and it happens to be snowing and it all comes together. So that's what you should buzz off. And then if you're happy with the image, if it's well received, obviously it means a lot. Um, But if it's not, you should just hold on to the fact that the process of getting the image was, was almost the most important thing. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely something I, and I, I put out a what was my 23, 23 goals or something when I wrote for um, Conquer Nature magazine, and one of them was oh, yeah. just to be less self critical. Yeah, I know I can I can sit there and I it's because I think it's because I post to Instagram so frequently, so I'm doing it literally every I post every two days. So oh wow, try, yeah. trying to I'm trying to beat this algorithm, trying to keep it all going, but. I, I never find beat the algorithm never beat the algorithm. It never works how I intend it to work, but it, I do find that, you know, it will come to the night before I'm posting and I've got maybe, I don't know. I think I've got about 15 draft posts currently sat within Instagram. And I, I have a weekly call where I will delete them all because I think they're not good enough. <laughs> so it's definitely, it's definitely something I'm trying to combat myself, but, yeah. I was seeing yeah. all my adder images yesterday and my macro and stuff like that. I um I, I took loads of shots in the field that I looked, I thought, oh, this is gonna look real good. And when you get it back on the computer, I end up deleting probably about 90% of them because they're And just... then and then normally they're normally really good images. You just sit there and it's like you said, Rich, you, you just start scrolling through Instagram, even sometimes before you've posted the photo you're thinking of posting, and then you see someone else's photo and you're thinking, ah, oh, there's yeah, no yeah. point. There's no point at all. But you know, it's it's what your viewers want to see rather than you know what it, it, another another follow another you know accounts followers want to see. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, both your Im- your images are great. You know, just looking at your your account now, Dan, like the, your your use of light and um, just your your feed just pops because of all the color in it. You know, it's um it's lovely. Oh. And I think Dan's not going to get out of his bedroom later on. Now. <laughs> I don't uh, film really. it. I don't film in my bedroom, Corey. I film in my office. <laughs> But I, I, yeah, I think like, like, like it, it's like anything, isn't it? Like I, I, I've never photographed um, foxes. Okay. I've been in the field where foxes have turned up quite a few times, but you, you know, your fox images are just absolutely stand out. And I think, I think you've got to think about the amount of people that have never even photographed or seen a wild fox, you know? And um, I, I think we're, we're so lucky to be able to get out in front of whatever we're getting out in front of that, you know, the images almost come a bit second, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. It's the moments that you share with wildlife yeah. are better sometimes than the images that you capture. I mean, it's nice It's nice to capture an image and document it and then share that or try to portray and share that experience with other people. But at the end of the day, just being there is, yeah, photography comes second best, photos become second best. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's um, 
I mean, I do love the experiences. Sometimes, obviously, if you can leave with a great image and stuff, it's um, the, the feeling is kind of like no other. But I mean, there's been times where, I mean, like yesterday, for example, and stuff like that, like being with the adders, there's been points where I knew I couldn't get the photos, but just to kind of sit and realize, you know, I'm this close to an adder and it's not bothered by my presence was, was brilliant. And I mean, Susie came along mm. with me. It's the first time we've gone out and done anything together, like wildlife related in months. I think even she was loving it. She was a bit poorly, and she kept reminding me of that. She was, um, <laughs> she was real poorly and stuff. So I was just uh, trying to ignore that part of it because you know what women are like. There's always something wrong with them. That's a if for any woman listening. That was a complete jerk. I do not believe that in the slightest. <laughs> I do, but, I it, but it is. It sometimes it's like I'll use the uh, and I'll I'll pronounce it properly. The Stalin murmuration. I went to photograph. I think it was a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it, Corey? Maybe even longer. Everything's yeah, related to one at the moment. I I only had the well, I had the five hundred mil lens, and then I had a seventy to two hundred. But it was far too much for any form of yeah. decent murmuration kind of shot. Yeah. But it just goes back to the experience. The experience was, you know, way better than any photo that I could have ever got. Purely for the fact that was my first experience, you know, seeing a proper murmuration. And, photo- and attempted to photograph it. But yeah, it's easy. Sometimes it's nice to just experience stuff without trying to worry about getting the photo of it. Yeah. And I think going back to YouTube, that it's kind of helped me with that a bit. And if you actually were to look at the videos, quite often I don't post images at the end. Um, yeah. and, and it's actually because I, I haven't taken anything that I'm particularly proud of because I put all of the efforts into filming it. But what, what's so nice about when I'm filming it is quite often I can just hit record on the back and let the camera do the thing and then just watch it, you know? And um, I, I like the stills part kind of doesn't come into it. I get so caught up in the whole thing. It's only when I get back, I'm like, ah, I don't have a, I don't have a single image to show for that. And that, that happens more and more, but I, it, it doesn't change how, how, how I felt when I was out in the field. And that's kind of what I've learned that, same with the workshops, you know, I'm out there watching wildlife every single day um, and not taking photos. And it's kind of taught me that the photos just aren't the most important. Look, Corey, you said it before, you, you want to come away with, with good photos. Like I'd, I'd, I'd be lying if I said I didn't, of course I do. But they're just not the most important thing to me anymore. It's good to have that mindset though. It means you can go out and enjoy nature and not have it completely on your mind, not be absolutely devastated if you come away with no images. And I'm slowly getting to that point. It's just nice to be out and just the fresh air. And I mean, yesterday walking around like pine forests and stuff like that was much more enjoyable than the actual photography. Yeah. That's, um, I mean, and that that's it. I mean, when I started wildlife photography, I'd always come home deflated if I didn't get the image. But I think that's because I was putting so much effort and focus into getting the photograph that I it took away from the whole enjoyment of just being out. So, I think it depends on the scenario. You will, yeah. If you spend money to go on a trip, like say if I went to Lunga to photograph the puffins and didn't see a single puffin, I got on a boat for an hour and a half, got incredibly seasick and um, mm. cold and, and whatever, and I've spent this money to go photograph and you don't see them, I'd probably be quite gutted then. But if you're just out in the field and you know that you might not see something, you might do like in the woodlands or the, the local park or whatever, um, just to be out in that is definitely much more enjoyable for me. Yeah, I think I think that's it. I think um, if you put too much pressure on it, then you're kind of almost setting yourself up for a bit of a fall, aren't you? Whereas if, if you go out with not too many expectations, then the chances are you're going to come away happy. Absolutely. You can end up burning yourself out as well by for doing sure. so much preparation and so and putting so many so much hope into getting the images that you know you'll burn yourself out mentally eventually. Yeah, so I, I think, and I I do go out when I'm doing stills photography. Um, I do go out with an image in mind. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm quite specific about it. It uh, doesn't mean I won't photograph other things, um, but I do go out kind of wanting a certain image from the conditions that are in front of me or the subject that I'm going to be working with. Um, but I don't care if it takes me, you know, four hours four days or, or four months to get that shot, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's like, I think I've spoken about it a couple of times, aren't I, Corey, on the podcast, the image of my, or well, my image of the stag dashing through the water at Bushy Park. I mean, it's been something I've tried for, Jesus, the last five years, I think. But that's always, it, it's always nice to go out with something in mind because it, it, it keeps your, 
it keeps you on your toes, I, I think. Yeah. You know, you're always looking for, you know, the subject, you're always looking for that perfect composition you want. It, it adds more, it does add excitement to it, but again, um, it just depends on how, how well your mind can deal with the failure. I know mind sometimes, especially after trying so hard, it can, can fuck you up a little bit and it can be like, ah, oh, shit. Uh, you start question. You start doubting yourself. I, I know I certainly start doubting myself, um, and then that can obviously lead to more negative stuff. But yeah, it is what it is. I guess that sometimes you, wildlife cannot be controlled. Uh, yeah, exactly that. And I think there's there's definitely day, like we all have days, don't we? And there's there's times where um, I'll go to certain locations that I should really avoid on when I'm having those days. Um, you know, you know, like. <laughs> Well, you mentioned Bushy Park before, right? Take that, take that as an example. I remember yeah. going over for the Red Deer Rut years ago. So flying over from Jersey, going over for the Red Deer Rut, um, meeting up with a friend of mine in the park. And um, it was middle of the day. The stags were kind of a bit lazy, but occasionally getting up and letting off a bellow. But yeah. the light was pretty contrasty. Um loads of other photographers at the same time all shooting the same composition and i remember just putting my camera on to feel really uninspired and and getting on the the plane back to jersey thinking ah oh, that was such a, a rubbish trip you know such a waste of time and money yeah um and, and i shouldn't have been thinking like that i should have been like here i am i'm lucky to be away from the office got a couple of days in london with a friend of mine just just enjoy it all you know watching wildlife but I definitely, definitely got caught up in that. And, and really what I should, probably should have said was, we're not going to get anything good at the moment with this light. So why don't we go to the pub instead and come back at sunset? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just think I, I found, especially last, God, yeah, it was last year. I forget that we're in a new year sometimes. Um, I, I certainly found last year at Bushy Park, I was feeling the same as you, Rich. I was definitely feeling quite uninspired. Oh, it was so busy this year. I mean, it was last... the busiest I've ever seen it. Same um, for me. I was photographing a, a male, and and just like within ten minutes, you go from there was me, Rob, and Luke who had all gone together, and then there was about twenty other photographers after a while. And that you think, bloody hell, it's just feels like when the cuckoo was about when we we're photographing that cuckoo and to start off there was a couple of people on that cricket pitch, and then by the end of it there was about fifty people or so. No, or the hoopoo. Uh... Up here, uh, yeah. The, the hoopoo, not they want the not the cuckoo, the hoopoo, that's what I meant. Um, not the cuckoo. Because we were talking about Colin earlier on. Yeah. It does, it it does feel really it does feel really uninspiring when you know you're there and sharing that moment with I think I was photographing a stag down in Bushy Park last year and there was about 50, 60 people all there. I could see them all lined up and I just walked off. It's like you say, Rich, you put your camera down. I just yeah, I just walked off. There's just yeah, there's just no point. It just feels you're all getting the same image, you're all getting the same composition. It's just so deflating. And that's but but then you can flip it on the head and use that to your advantage. So you can disappear and go off and find, you know, the more different stags to photograph, more interesting compositions and stuff. And it's I think I briefly touched on it in the article that I wrote about it. Um you know, you you get you, they almost move like a crowd, don't they, to photographers in them sort of situations and they'll all go for the same thing and it does open you up to getting better images sometimes. It's, it's like I said about um, Mole before, you know, if you're prepared to just walk off and go away from the hot spots, um, you, you can find stuff and, <clears throat> excuse me again, just getting over a bit of a cold, so uh, sorry if I keep clearing my throat. That's okay. Um, yeah, so I, I find that when I'm in Richmond Park, it's you could still get really, really creative. You know, I was just talking about that one example before, but you can still get really creative. But you, yeah, you've got, it's it's kind of that day has pushed me, like you say, to to, to think outside the box a bit um, and to use light, maybe find a smaller stag. That would probably be my bit of advice to somebody if they were saying, oh, it's, it's really busy there. How can I get away from the crowd? Just find a slightly smaller stag. They, yeah. they, 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 they tend to be just as active, if not sometimes more. And um you can find them ten a penny during the rutting season. Um, occasionally, you find those stags that have taken them like not had a good night in um, in in the rut, and they'll take themselves off for a few hours and lie down in the bracken. No one wants to stick around and wait for that stag to get up and get its energy back because they want to be photographed and want to sort of stand them. But if you just lie around and just wait for that one and wait for the light to get good, 
um, you might you might get rewarded. You know, so there's definitely definitely ways you can still get creative in these places. Absolutely, you you went, didn't you, Corey? This last year to to Bushy Park. Yeah, yeah, I've done it the last three last three years, I think. I've uh, I've never actually been to Richmond Park. Um, I've never been to Richmond either. I just got to Bushy. Yeah, me too. Um, might have to try Richmond next next year, just as a bit of a mix up. Yeah, yeah and change of scenery. It, it'd yeah, be sorry, interesting. Just to say, to uh, sorry, I've cut you off twice there. It's all right. It's one of those where like you you hear the other person talk, and you pause for a second to see if they're going to talk again, yeah, and then you yeah, risk yeah. talking just then to do the same thing. Yeah, no, go on, carry on. Um, that was it. Yeah, I try it this year. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to say. I mean, we should say that like um, for, for people listening and stuff, like how, how great these places are. That for for people maybe in and around London, where I'm not saying wildlife isn't accessible. There's, there's amazing wildlife in and around London. Um, but these places like like Richmond Park are, are places where I, I would say that they, they kind of help me um, excel in wildlife photography because you've, you've got your guaranteed subject um, or subjects because you've got the fallow deer there and you've got like the woodpeckers, the little owls, you've got all the birds on the ponds. So they're, they're great, great places for um, wildlife photographers, especially wildlife photographers that are just getting into it. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's kind of one of those things, you know, it's like, where, you know, when you moan about being sat in traffic, but then you realise you are the traffic. It's the same yeah. kind of thing with places yeah. like Richmond Park, you know. It would it would be silly of me to say, oh, you know, these places are full of photographers that are out having a really nice time, enjoying nature, when I'm that exact same person. Doing the you know? same thing, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's, I love it there. It's like you say, you, you've got your guaranteed subjects, but um, you've still got to put the photography effort in yourself. You can have anybody can have a guaranteed subject, but if you dial the eye for it, and you don't have the patience to take out a good shot, then it can, uh, it can just be redundant. You might as well be at a zoo. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and I think that's why people come on workshops. You know, my my Richmond Park workshops are, re- are really popular during the rutting season, and I think that, that it could it can be, and I know it has been for a couple of people where they photograph there loads of times because they live nearby, but they're struggling to get anything different they're struggling to see things differently um yeah and you just need that helping hand it. and that insight to it yeah yeah so yeah. I, i'm looking forward to going back and and, and trying again uh, i'm not i don't want to rush it because i'm just looking forward to the summer because it's been so cold recently um and i'm looking forward to a bit of fishing so i just don't but i'm definitely looking forward to the rutting season again so um i think we're about um about ready to wrap up um so before we do dan Fire away. Yes, I, uh, as you know, Rich, I ask everybody or every single guest this extremely deep and slightly cringy question. Um, but what does sort of photography... I guess, I guess we'll go down the photography route and sort of the nature route for you. So so what does sort of photography and nature, you know, wildlife photography mean to you as a person? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's hard to put it... Um into words and it'd be so easy to say it means everything but i mean it's just my my medicine um you know it's my way of it's my way of escaping the everyday stresses um and and i think without it i don't know where i'd be i don't want that to come across too dramatic but i've been through some dark times before finding wildlife photography and um i'm forever grateful actually not just wildlife photography just appreciating wildlife like I, I i think i can't even remember what it was like to not hear birdsong when i'm out on a walk or not spot the buzzard as i'm driving down the motorway or whatever it is and i think it's really helped distract my mind um and take my mind from being in quite a negative place at times and overthinking and, and just help me switch off and I, you know the photography comes second to that but um it's, uh, it's hard to sum up but it, it, it just means it means more than just the images. That, that's for sure. Beautiful, very nicely put. I, I couldn't, I couldn't put it better myself, to be honest. I think yeah, we we ask everybody, and I sit there and think, what does it mean to me? And I'm like, mm, and that, there's the words that I'm looking for, but you just, it's hard to kind of say it. Yeah, I I, I think like um, you, you never want. I mean, I've listened to the um, shows that you've done, so I think. The last one was you two, or was it Megan? I can't, I can't remember. But I think she she, she gave she had a fantastic answer, and um, I, I I think that it would be very easy to script it 
like being prepared for the for the question. But the, the truth is, it just wouldn't be sincere. And I, I, I find it hard. So I get asked it a lot. What's what does it mean to me? And I think as it's become my job, um, people quite often ask me if I still got the same love for it. But yeah, if if not more, um, mm. it, it's just I get I now get to spend more time out in nature, and I don't have to do a job I don't enjoy. So it probably means more to me now than ever. I can't say I'm not massively jealous. Um, yeah. But it's good to it's good to have that. So, well, that was very nicely put. Um, no, thank you for for coming on and, and chatting to us. I know life must be busy, especially with a newborn. It's never easy. Um, so it's been very nice to to sit and talk to you. Uh, it's yeah. all good. Likewise, guys, I, I appreciate thanks. you asking me to come on. No, well, let us know when you're um, when you're coming up to Bempton and that. Like I say, well, um, I'll, uh, there's a train that runs from Hull to Bempton. Um, pretty much every morning, so I'll um, I'll jump on and and meet you across. Dan yeah. might drag his ass up from from Bradford. It's only two hours for me, so yeah, I'll be okay, over there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Absolutely. yeah, cool. I'll, I'll definitely be up. I um I love it. The, the those barn hours that you get first thing in the morning just uh, are the icing on the cake for me. So those barn hours will hunt throughout the entire day. There are oh, weird, were they really? They're a weird group of barn owls. I think they're, they're, uh, they're so old. strange. Yeah, they it's, are. There's a resident two, and then obviously they have the young every year, which some of them stick about. But yeah, they will. I've been there, and they've been hunting two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, uh, shorty right. owls as well. Um, you get a lot of shorties and stuff too. So, um, the peregrine falcons—they're very um chilled out and very forbidding. Um, they're forgiving. Sorry. Um, with with people. So yeah, it's there's there's a lot of stuff on there, and it's. I think it's a place that I mean, if I lived as far away as you did, I'd want a couple of days up there and that. So it's 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 fantastic, and you've got all like flamber nearby as well, which gives you different opportunities to photograph the puffins from a different point of view. And yeah, there's a lot you can do there. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, well, I'll yeah, let you know for sure. Brilliant. Well, if you hang around in the back for a couple of minutes while me and Dan finish, and then we'll check in um, afterwards and just run for everything. Yeah, absolutely. Thank Sweet. you very much for coming on. Thanks, Cheers. mate. Cheers. Well, that was another lovely episode, mate. Yeah, last one of the series. Last one of the series. That's so, it's it's mental how when you mentioned it earlier, it has been ticking over on my mind as well while we've been you know recording this app, and I can't believe how quick the first series has gone. I know it's um it's mad. This episode will come out on the twelfth of April. And then I think I mean we'll have pretty much finished recording the second series by then. Um and then we're gonna be off for what, what six weeks until the next one's come up? Uh yeah, which will be nice, a little break. Aye, well It'll be um, it'll be quite strange though, I feel. Um I'll I'll almost miss uh I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll almost miss recording them. I mean, we recorded our first episode, what, was it the 30th of January, around that time? Something like that, yeah. So it's been like a solid, nearly a solid two months of, you know, recording. So yeah, I, probably, I think I'll miss it. Well, we're still going to be recording, we're just delaying releasing. Yeah, I'd, I'll be I'll be honest, and this probably sounds a little bit weird and a bit cringy, but I, I like to listen to us in the car on the way to work sometimes. Oh, I, do. I just upload it and then that's it, I'm done. Okay, so I, I'm weird then. <laughs> um, between this episode and the first episode of Series 2, we'll be doing our York Free Peaks climb. We still we will. Up. It's not raising a lot of money. Uh, I'm at a not... point now where I'm happy. and uh... You know what? It is what it is. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, we will keep sharing it. I know I'm really crap at sharing it. Um, just being super busy with work. But yeah, I'll... In fact, I'll as I'm eating my tea after I've filmed this, after we've recorded this episode, I'll, I'll share it. But... Yeah, and I mean we say it every single episode. We don't, don't we? But you know, give as much as you can. If it's you know fifty p, then it's fifty p towards a great cause. But do you know what, mate? I'm really looking forward to it. I after that twenty four mile bike ride earlier on, I am not. I'm pumped for this. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Really looking forward to it. It'll be a it'll be a good day. No, I'm, I think it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to doing some landscape photography and stuff. So yeah. It'd be a good day. Yeah, it'd um, yeah, be really good. Before we finish, yes, do you want to choose our photo of the week? Yes. Now, I say this every single week. I live in a bunker. Um, well, I've I recorded in a bunker, so I may get signal. I may not get signal. We shall see. Um, so I'm just loading it up now. If not, I'll let Corey pick. Um, yeah, it says lovely no internet connection, which is great. Oh, hang on. 
Photos are loading. Photos are loading. Ooh. This is going to be a tough one. This is going to be a really, really tough one. However, I'm I'm going to go. I guess. Yeah, go on, guess. Um, uh, the Buzzard Photo by Steve Alcock. That would be a strong contender for me. It was. All, it was all up there. frogs. It was up there, and what I'm going with is they're not frogs. They are the mating toads. Oh, well, I only had a brief look at them. From uh, Luke Smith. Um, is, that, is that one you're going for? Yeah, I am. I, I love toads. I think they're sick. Um, yet to photograph. Well, I photographed them, but they were pretty poor photos, so I would well, very much like to. If you hurry up and get to um, to Hull, to this Adder location, I I had my boots filled yesterday. I'm just going to quickly send you... Um, Send you the well, two photos on Messenger now. There you go. Have a look at them. That was from yesterday. I, yeah, there are some down by me. Not so, well, literally down the road from me, but it's just somewhere I never visit. So maybe I'll get out. Maybe I'll get out with the camera at some point. Cool. See well, good them. photo. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Really good photo. Very good photo. I just want to give a special uh, shout out to a reel that has been, well, we've been tagged in a reel by Max uh, Wildlife Photos. It's pretty cool. It's dedication. Pretty cool, it? It's the uh, it starts with like footage of his ground hide. Pretty dedi- pretty pretty dedicated to be laying in all that shit. Oh, I'm just watching it now, and it is his shit as well. That's like cold war and everything. So yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, good photo. Um, you got to love a portrait as well. So yeah. Hi, hi. Well, I'm done. I'm I'm also done. I think that wraps up very nicely, mate. Um, series one. Series one done. Wow. On to series two next. All right. Well, if you listen to this on the twelfth of April, the next episode will probably be released early mid May, something like that. Yeah, that is uh, two weeks before our birthdays as well. It is when this it episode is. releases. We're going um, shepherd uh, cottaging, sorry, for our for our birthdays, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, well, it's news to me, but yeah, whatever, mate. Sweet, cool. Cool, right, that's right. it. I'm done. <laughs> Smash it. Well, this has been the Wild Top Podcast with me, Dan, co-host Corey, and our guest Richard Campion. Um, and until next time, guys, catch you all in a bit. Au revoir.